So last week we started talking about the book of Revelation. And if you weren't here last week, I'll fill you in. Uh, Revelation is a book that speaks in pictures, it speaks in images. Uh, not so much in, in details, just in the, the big ideas. And so in order for Revelation to really speak to us, we need to, to let the image speak for itself, which is what we we're going to try to do over the coming, uh, well, six weeks plus today. Uh, but when we read Revelation, we have to remember that it's not a book written to us. It's a book written to a specific community or group of communities in a particular time and place and atmosphere and climate. And, and so when we read Revelation, we are, in a sense, reading over the shoulders of our ancestors. And so the image may not say exactly the same thing to us as it would have said to them. So for us to, to really understand what Revelation is trying to say, we may need a bit of background information. So this morning as we get started, I want us to take a moment to think about the Greek and Roman gods. And if you've ever seen a sculpture of one of the Greek or Roman gods, then you've, you probably already know the important things about them. Uh, the big thing is that they are anthropomorphic, which means they look like human beings. Other gods in the ancient world look like uh, human-animal hybrids. You know, maybe they have uh, the, the body of a man to the waist, and then from the waist down, they're a horse. Or uh, maybe they're a, a human being, but their head is that of a donkey, or something like that. Uh, but the, the Greco-Roman gods look like people. And they're not just people, they're beautiful people. Look at them. How, you, if you woke up and looked like that, men, you would not be... You, you would, you'd be all right with that, right? There are some good-looking gentlemen that are the, the Greco-Roman gods. They don't have muffin tops. They don't have acne. They never have a bad hair day. They're in, like, they're in the prime of life, and you never see the Greco-Roman gods outside the prime of life, unless you're talking about a nativity of one of the gods, you know, one of their birth stories. But you never see, like, Zeus in his awkward teen years, and you never see Zeus dying of old age. They're always locked in this prime of life. And I just, I find that absolutely fascinating. Because I look at that, and then I look at modern day depictions of Jesus. Jesus is almost always portrayed as a human being, which of course makes sense. Sometimes you see him as a lamb or as a lion, but he always is a human being. He's never a hybrid. Uh, he's beautiful, right? The, the one in the lower left corner there, when, when that guy played Jesus in whatever he played, uh, there were, Twitter went ablaze with a hashtag, hot Jesus. Okay? He's a beautiful Jesus. You never see Jesus with a muffin top, and you never see Jesus with acne, and he's never having a bad hair day. He uses herbal essence shampoo. He has long flowing locks. He's, he's pretty, right? He's ruggedly handsome. And he's, he's Jesus, the friend of children. He's, uh, he's carrying a baby lamb. I love that. Uh, Jesus, who uh, is, is athletic. He's, he's handsome. He's got his, uh, often he'll have that, the Miss America sash, right? You got Miss America Jesus. In many ways, modern day depictions of Jesus look a whole lot like the Greek and Roman gods. Until you get to Revelation. And in Revelation, when we meet Jesus for the first time, it's a bit different. In Revelation 1, beginning in verse 10, the writer says, On the Lord's day I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His hair and his head were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was shining like the sun in all its brilliance. Just once I want to see this Jesus on a thank you card, or on a get well soon card, or on a t-shirt. This is not Jesus the babysitter. 
This is not the ruggedly handsome carpenter Jesus. This Jesus is grotesque. And he's terrifying. And in fact, John says that when he sees him, he falls down like he's dead. To see this Jesus strikes terror into your heart. And this Jesus comes to, to John and he says, I want you to write letters to these seven churches. Now let's talk just briefly about uh, life in these seven churches. Uh, these are real churches, real cities from the Roman Empire at the time that, that Revelation was written. Uh, they're large-ish. Ephesus is the largest one. I think it's something like 200,000 people live in Ephesus at the time. And the, the cities are arranged sort of in a circle. So there's a highway that connects them. So if you start in Ephesus and go down the highway, you will pass these seven cities in the order that they appear in Revelation. So the idea is that uh, the Ephesus gets the book of Revelation and they read it and then they pass it on down the highway to the next church who then reads it and they pass it on. Then they pass it on and on down the line. Now, these churches are facing uh, a lot of temptation and a lot of compulsion to compromise. They're being told that as, uh, as residents of their cities and as citizens of the Roman Empire, certain things are expected of them. It's expected that they are going to worship the gods. It's expected that they are going to abuse their slaves, that they're going to bring shame on other people to bring honor to themselves. It's expected that they'll attend the gladiatorial events in the theater. It's expected that they'll worship Caesar and the, the, uh, his entourage. And so when the churches don't do these things, when instead they offer their allegiance only to Jesus and they offer their worship only to Jesus, when they treat their slaves with dignity and honor and respect as a human being, and sometimes as a fellow brother or sister in Christ, when they refuse to, uh, to bring shame on others and, and instead sacrifice their own honor, that doesn't go over well. And so they face a, a lot of persecution. At one point, it becomes very systematized and, and official from the government, but, uh, but for most of the time that, that, uh, that we're talking about, it's just, it's a cultural, social pressure. And so as a result of them not doing the things that are expected of them, many of these Christians lose their home, they lose their jobs, they lose their welfare, they lose all their marketable goods. They, uh, they're cold and they're hungry and they have to explain to their children, the reason that you're cold and hungry is because I love Jesus so much. Which I can't imagine that's a real easy conversation to have with your kids. Now, the temptation or the compulsion to succumb, to compromise, is not unique to the first century, to the original readers of this book. It's a perennial issue. It's something that comes up over and over and over in every day and every age. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter when you live. When you make the kinds of claims that Christians make, it's, it's like treason. It's confrontational. When you stand up and say, I believe in resurrection, and I believe in redemption, and, I, and that means I believe in forgiveness, and I believe in mercy, and I believe in, in treating others honorably, I believe in, in uh, leading by example, I believe in the path of descent, I believe that the end has already started, and that I believe in, in judgment and in wrath and in purity and sanctity, that doesn't go over well. When you stand up and say, I belong to another kingdom and my allegiance is to that kingdom and my allegiance is not to this other kingdom or this other leader or this other dream or this other agenda, people get upset about that. And so the, the Christian message has always kind of been confrontational. <sighs> uh, so the, the Christian message has always been confrontational and so there's always this voice from the outside. There's always this compulsion or this temptation saying, just pipe down. You guys just go, go to your church and just do whatever it is that you do and just leave us out of it. That's about as peaceable as it gets. It's only more hostile and bloody from there. And so there's always the temptation to cut corners at work or to let your eyes linger on that woman in that ad or to uh, come back to your friend with an even more offensive insult to crush your friends because you've got the better comeback. There's always the temptation to, to buy more and more and more stuff, to always have the newest or the safest or the prettiest or the brand namest stuff. There's always the temptation to be greedy or to be stingy or to, uh, to listen to your body more than to the Holy Spirit. 
So the, the things that they're going through are not entirely unique to their own day and age. They are perennial things. But they're facing them. And, and so Jesus comes to them, this grotesque, terrifying Jesus comes to these seven churches, or he comes to John and says, I want you to send this message in these seven letters. And these seven letters are written to do two things. First of all, they're written to encourage the faithful. Because there are some people in these churches who have not bowed the knee to Rome, who have not succumbed, they have not compromised, they have not, uh, they've not fudged on the truth. They've remained faithful, and they need to know that it's not in vain. They just need to hear that their perseverance is going to be rewarded. They just need to know that in the end, it's all going to be worth it. And so Jesus has John write to encourage them, to let them know that they will be rewarded, and it's not in vain, and it will be worth it. The other reason these letters are written is to rebuke the unfaithful, because there are people in these churches who have turned away People who have invited in false teachers. People who have uh, off, uh, eaten food that's been offered to idols, which is a form of idol worship. Uh, there are people who uh, have taken advantage of the grace of God. Or they have not kept their pants on. Or they, have, uh, they speak out of both sides of their mouth. There are all kinds of things that they're doing. And so Jesus writes these letters, or he has John write them, to say, God will have no more of this. There needs to be an end to this. No more compromise. Now, originally, when we were going to do this series, it was going to be seven weeks. We were going to take one week and look at each letter. And so we were going to get real in-depth into each of the seven cities and, and what was kind of going on in those cities and, and then get the message there. But since we've changed the series, we only have one lesson to talk about the seven churches. And, and as a result, that means we only have about half a lesson left to talk about the seven churches. And so we don't have time to go real in depth and we're not going to read all of all of the seven letters. Let me just pull out a couple of highlights, a couple of things, two things out of the letters as a whole. There's one phrase that appears in all seven of the letters. It's the words, to him who overcomes. To him who overcomes. So for example, uh, to Ephesus, Jesus says, to him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life. Uh, to Smyrna, he who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Uh, to he, he who overcomes will be dressed in white. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in my, the temple of my God. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus writes to the, the faithful, and he says, if you stick it out, if you hold on and weather the storm, if you can make it to the end, then in the end, I will do this and this and this and this and this. So keep your eyes on the prize, ladies and gents. Now remember who it is that's saying all of this. It's the blazing eyes, white-haired, brazen-footed, sword for a tongue, Jesus. And when he says he's going to do this, you better believe he's going to do it. Now, if it were Miss America Jesus, with his herbal essence hair, carrying a baby lamb surrounded by dancing children, walking beside a peaceful stream who says, I'm going to do all these things, you might be, you might, uh, I don't know. Who are you to give me all of these things? But when lightning eyes Jesus says, I will, the correct answer is, yes, sir. Not how do I know I can trust you? Because look at me. That's how you know you can trust me. And so Jesus promises to give those who are faithful life and power. He says, if you remain faithful, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life. Nobody's eaten from the tree of life since the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve rebel against God. And God says, if they now reach out and take from the tree of life, they will live forever. And we can't have that. And so he banishes them from the garden. Nobody has eaten from the tree of life since. And now Jesus says, if you remain faithful to the end, I will let you back in. And you can eat from the tree and so live forever. He says, if you overcome, then you will not fall victim to the second death. The second death is something that's only, it's only mentioned in Revelation. And it refers to when God brings his judgment to the world, all those who are dead are raised up and God judges them, and those who are not on Team Jesus 
die again. They die a second time. And he says that if you make it to the end, even if you die, when you're raised up, you don't have the second death. You stay alive. Why? Because you have the tree of life. He says, if you overcome to the end, I will give you a white stone, which to us might be like, that's, thanks, Jesus, for this stone. But, but a white stone in their day, that's the victor's trophy. That's what you give the person who wins the race. That's when you're, when you're the MVP of the Super Bowl, when you win the Indianapolis 500 and you have the giant trophy that you're holding, that's the white stone. Jesus says, I'll give you that. If you hold on to the end and overcome, I will give you the victor's trophy. If you overcome, you will have authority over the nations. You will reign on the earth, which is kind of opposite from how it is right now. Right now, there's the powers, the principalities and the powers of this dark world that they're the ones in charge and they call the shots and they decide how the world works. And Christians, when we make claims about how the world works, we say the world works on forgiveness and on love and, and the principalities say, no, 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 no. They work on coercion. They work, the world revolves around power. And if you, if you hold on to the end, one day those tables will turn. One day you will be in power and they will be the paupers. Now, that's all if you remain faithful. On the other hand, if you don't remain faithful, then you don't exactly receive a reward. Instead, Jesus promises something a little different. He says, repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Therefore, remember what you have learned, uh, what you have received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. So Jesus speaks to these churches, and he says, if you do not repent, if you do not get back on the straight and narrow, if you do not straighten things out, there will be retribution. Now, two of the churches, he doesn't say anything like that to. I think it's Smyrna and Philadelphia. I think those are the two. He has nothing bad to say about them. He's like, you, you two, y'all are good. Keep up the good work. But the rest of you need to seriously reconsider your priorities because if you don't repent, bad things are going to come your way. And remember who it is that's saying this. It's the white-haired, blazing eyes, brazen-footed, sword for a tongue Jesus that says he's going to bring the wrath of heaven and hell on those who do not remain in him. Now, if it had been Miss America Jesus, Jesus the babysitter, surrounded by uh, the, the joyful dancing children, holding a baby lamb, walking beside a peaceful stream who says, I'm going to do all these things, you would be tempted to call his bluff. No, you're not. Jesus wouldn't hurt his church. But here he says he will. When lightning eyes Jesus says, I will bring the wrath of hell on you, you better believe he will. Jesus promises death and surprise and rejection. He says, if you do not repent, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. Now, in chapter 1, the lampstand is a, we're told explicitly, the lampstands are the seven churches. So each church is being represented by this, like, pillar that you put a candle on, basically. Uh, and, he, and he says, I will remove it. Essentially, you will no longer be a church. You will cease to exist. You will no longer call on my name. If you continue in the ways that you have been going and you do not repent, I will remove you from your place. He says, that if you do not repent, then I will bring the pain. I will war against my own church. I, Jesus promises he will fight against his own church if his church does not repent. If they continue to try to walk the line, if they continue to try to ride the fence, he will bring the pain. And then he says, I'll spit you out of my mouth like lukewarm coffee. Hot coffee is good. Iced coffee is good to some people. But room temperature coffee that's been sitting out for an hour and a half? <laughs> Jesus says, if you do not repent and you continue to try to walk, walk the fence, 
I'm going to come and I'm going to spit you. I will vomit you out is the literal word. I will vomit you out of my mouth. I want nothing to do with you. Because Jesus essentially draws a line in the sand. There is good and there is evil. You are on this side or you are on that side. And if you try to walk the fence, you're on that side. You are either completely for me or you are completely against me. There is no some. There is no sometimes. There's no kind of. There's no to a certain degree. There's no I'll follow Jesus to the cross but not on the cross. There is either you are holy with him or you are holy against him. So just to summarize, John has this vision where he sees Jesus, white hair, blazing eyes, brazen footed, sword for a tongue, face shining like the sun, so grotesque and terrifying that John falls down like he's dead. And this Jesus wants to send a message to his church. And the message is, if you hold on to the end, you will be rewarded. But if you continue in your laziness and your immorality, there will be punishment. There will be retribution. Now, the rest of the book of Revelation centers around a war. From this point out, it's good versus evil. It is heaven versus hell. It is Jesus versus the principalities and the powers of this dark world from here on out. And so Jesus begins the book of Revelation by saying, are you with me or not? Hey, churches, are you on this side or are you on that side? Come over to my side. Here's the thing. When I see this Jesus, my first thought is, I don't want to be on the wrong side of the line from that guy. Because whoever he is, he's winning. In the end, he's going to win. And in some ways, he already has one, which we'll talk a little bit about next week. In some ways, he already has one. And so I want to be on his side. And so Jesus calls us right at the very beginning, are you with me or are you against me? Are you for me or are you going to continue to try to ride the fence and have the best of both worlds? Will you continue in your laziness? Will you continue in your immorality, in your idolatry? There is a line that divides good from evil. But in the words of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn, I don't know how you say his name, in the words of Alexander, what's his name? The line that divides good from evil is not a line that, uh, that runs between states or between classes nor between political parties, but right through every human heart. The line that divides good from evil runs right through each one of us. We are this admixture of good and evil, of hope, and of hopelessness, of peace and corruption. We are this conglomeration, this mixture, and the line that divides good from evil runs right through each of us. And so Jesus begins this whole thing by calling us to live on this side. You know, I, there, there's this idea in our culture that, uh, that we are this admixture, that we are, there are some parts of us that are good and there are parts of us that are evil, and so the parts of us that are evil, it's okay for them to be that way. That how, whatever is, is right. Whatever is ought to be that way. It's not true. There are parts of us that are good and there are parts of us that are evil. And Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, calls us to repent and to overcome and to walk away from the principalities and the powers of this dark world. Next week, we're going to look at chapters 4 and 5 if you want to know what to be reading for for next week, 4 and 5. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, we love you. We are grateful for your word, and we are grateful for your servant, John, who uh, would record these visions for us. We thank you that they continue to speak across generations and across cultures. Lord, we pray that you would empower us uh, that you would give us the courage and the boldness to be wholly committed to you. Father, we pray that the parts of us that are uh, dark and rebellious would, uh, would repent. We pray that you would highlight those, that you would show us what, uh, what parts of our lives need to be done away with. And then we pray that you would give us the courage to follow through with that. Uh, Lord, for any uh, who are among us that, uh, that do not know you, that have not placed their trust in you, 
uh, who have not been baptized, we pray that, uh, that you would speak to their heart and that you would encourage them to take that step as well. Lord, we pray for your blessing in the coming week. We pray that you will, uh, that you will open our eyes, that we can see the world for what it is and not just uh, bricks and mortar and, uh, and names of people, but that we would see the spiritual reality behind all of that. Lord, we love you. And we pray all these things in the name of your servant, Jesus. Amen. Love you guys.